Part two, chapter five B of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. At this time, Spain, having concluded peace with the French Republic, had disbanded the greater part of her army, probably without paying them. The roads were infested with brigands, especially the mountains of the Sierra Morena, which we had to cross. We travelled in a convoy composed of several carriages only. We did not take any military escort, which would probably have been in league with the brigands, the former soldiers. But the mounted travellers who joined the convoy had taken the precaution to be armed to the teeth. A convoy was usually composed of from fifteen to eighteen covered chariots drawn by mules. It is thus that we set out from Cadiz. We occupied, my husband, my son and myself, one of these chariots, in which we were stretched out at full length upon our mattresses. Below, in the bottom of the chariot, was placed our baggage, covered with a bed of straw which filled the spaces between the trunks. A hood of cane, artistically sewn and covered by a tarpaulin, protected us from the sun during the day and from the humidity during the night, for it happened several times that we preferred the chariot to an inn. But in speaking so soon of our departure, I have anticipated, because we remained a week at Cadiz. Every evening we walked upon the beautiful promenade of the Alameda, which looks out on the sea where you can breathe a little air after having endured during the day a heat of ninety-five degrees. A spectacle which I have never forgotten was the magnificent bullfight, the day of Saint-Jean. This national fate of Spain has been described so often that I will not attempt to write of it here. The amphitheatre was immense and held at least four or five thousand persons who were seated upon the steps and were protected from the sun by a canvas awning similar to the velum of the Roman amphitheatres. The awning was kept constantly wet by a spray-like fine rain, which did not go through the cloth. Thus, although the performance began after the midday mass and lasted until sunset, I do not recall having suffered a moment from the heat. They killed ten bulls, who were so beautiful and so well bred that they would have made the fortune of an American farmer. The matador was the first of his kind at this epoch. He was a handsome young man of twenty-five years. In spite of the terrible danger which he ran, on account of his remarkable agility, you did not feel any anxiety. Certainly, at the moment when the two adversaries, alone face to face, looked steadily at each other, before the bull rushed upon the matador, the most poignant emotion which could possibly be felt gripped all of the spectators. You could have heard a pin drop. But you must understand that the matador does not give the coup d'épée. He only directs the point of the sword upon which the bull rushes to impale himself. This spectacle was an epoch in my life and no other has left upon me so powerful an impression. I have never forgotten the slightest detail, and the recollection is as fresh in my memory after so many years as if I had seen it yesterday. The day fixed for our departure, we let the convoy set out, and remained my husband and my son and myself to dine with Mr. Langton. A bark which had been prepared by his thoughtfulness was to take us to the other side of the bay to rejoin our caravan at Port Saint Marie, where we were to pass the night. During this long journey, we did not travel faster than a man can walk on foot. I was feeling so ill that my husband hesitated to let me set out, and yet there was no means of drawing back. Our baggage had been sent forward. We had paid half of the cost of our trip as far as Madrid. Our passport had been visaed, and Monsieur de Roxant, a Republican consul, would have regarded any delay with suspicion. He would have attributed it to some pretext. 
and as i have always believed that one can surmount any evil except perhaps a broken leg the thought never occurred to me to remain at cadiz we therefore dined with mr langton after having been present at the departure of our travelling companions who were to sleep at port saint marie nothing could be more delightful in point of neatness and care than this place of mr langton which was kept in the english fashion he had adopted none of the spanish practices except those customary to avoid the inconvenience of the very hot climate the house was built around a square court filled with flowers on the ground floor there was a line of arcades and an open gallery at the first floor an awning stretched at the height of the roof covered the whole surface of the court in the middle a jet of water reached the canvas which being thus constantly wet communicated a delightful freshness to the whole house i admit that i experienced a very painful feeling in thinking that instead of remaining in this agreeable place it was necessary for me to begin a long journey in a heat of ninety-five degrees but the die was cast and it was necessary to depart after this farewell dinner towards evening we entered the bark and in an hour and a half the wind being favourable we arrived at port st marie there we found our caravan composed of fourteen carriages and six or seven hidalgos armed from head to foot the aim of our second day's journey was jerez situated at a distance of only five leagues as i had need of rest we made up our minds once more to let the caravan go ahead and to rejoin it in the evening we therefore took dinner at an early hour at port st marie a very pretty locality then we took a cabriolet similar to those which i see here at pisa where i am writing these recollections our vehicle was attached to a large mule which had no bridle which seemed to me curious upon the head of the mule was balanced a high plume to which bells were attached a young boy with whip in hand sprang lightly upon the shafts uttered some cabalistic words and the mule set out at a trot as rapid as a good hunting gallop the route was superb and we went like the wind the mule obeying docilely the voice of his little driver avoiding obstacles and winding through the streets of the villages which we traversed with a wonderful sagacity at first i was afraid but reflecting that it was the custom of the country to drive this way i became resigned arrived at harris i was curious to know the value of a mule like the one which had conducted us and was told that it was worth from fifty to sixty louis which seemed to me quite dear the following day began our real travels i was still indisposed but stretched out as i was upon a good mattress and the road being very fine i did not suffer more than i would have if i had remained quiet at two o'clock we stopped for dinner in some wretched inn and it happened two or three times that we preferred to pass the night in our chariot rather than to sleep in bed so filthy as to be disgusting it was night when we arrived at cordova as we were travelling a certain distance behind all the other members of the party had already found their lodgings when we reached the inn as there were only beds to be had at the inn it was necessary to look for a place to eat we finally succeeded with some difficulty on account of the advanced hour in finding a kind of cabaret where we could only obtain some bread and a few slices of fried bacon the following morning there was a delay in the departure of the convoy which gave me an opportunity to see the magnificent cathedral of cordova of which so many descriptions have been written you can readily believe that travelling in so uncomfortable a manner and also feeling quite ill in the heat which reigned in andalusia from midday to three o'clock the period of the day that we ordinarily stopped i did not feel like visiting the monuments this time we passed an hour in walking through the forest of columns of this cathedral 
the muleteers came to urge us to set out they were carrying sufficient provisions for two meals which we were to take in the open that day as there was no dwelling in existence in the part of the country which we were going to traverse on leaving cordova we rode for a whole hour in the midst of groves of lemon trees and of moorish olive trees which were abundantly watered before arriving at the wall of the ancient city of which vestiges are still being uncovered this will give an idea of the immense surface which was covered by this large moorish city of other days as in italy you obtain an idea in the same way of the limits of ancient rome we had our dinner as had been arranged near a well in the midst of a pasture covered with sheep the eye could not measure the extent of this plain which was several leagues long and covered in part with fine grass and in part with dwarf myrtle trees several pomegranates covered with blossoms arose around the well this halt had something oriental about it which singularly pleased me i preferred it very much to the stops of three hours in the dirty inns which were always so hot the next day and the days following we crossed the sierra morena and saw two pretty little cities of la colota and la carolina these had been built by german colonists and we observed that certain characteristics of the german physiognomy had not yet been entirely effaced we encountered children with blonde hair whose complexion as dark as that of the spaniards was in marked contrast with their blue eyes these little cities are picturesque and are constructed with regularity on fine sites this route which is very beautiful is bordered on the hills by a parapet of marble at the time this was the only road between the south of spain and castile to my great regret we did not pass by toledo we arrived at aranquez for dinner the fifteenth day of our journey i think here we remained for the rest of the day we admired the fresh shade the handsome weeping willows and the green prairies after having come from andalusia which was baked by the sun of july it seemed to us like a green oasis in the middle of a desert the river tagus although very small is conducted with such art through this charming valley as to produce everywhere a delightful freshness the court was not then at aranquez nevertheless for some reason which i have forgotten we did not visit the chateau the following day we reached madrid after a halt of two hours at puerta del sol while our baggage was being examined ransacked and inspected it would have been useless to show any impatience for the sang froid of the castilians is not put out by anything finally the signal for our departure was given and they took us to the hotel a mediocre inn located in a small street here we were assigned quite a good room my husband immediately dispatched the letters and packages with which mr langton had charged us for his wife and his two daughters then i made a more careful toilette than that of my chariot with the intention of going to see these ladies after our dinner but they called on us first a half hour had hardly elapsed when we received a visit from two of the most beautiful ladies i have ever seen baron dandier and mademoiselle carmen langton the mother who was ill had not been able to go out their brother-in-law monsieur brown accompanied them his wife who was dead had been the third mademoiselle langton who was said to have been more beautiful even than her sisters these ladies showed us great kindness and attention and their brother-in-law proposed that we should take a little furnished lodging in the quarter where these ladies lived he took charge of all the necessary arrangements and placed himself at our disposal for all the time that we remained at madrid our sojourn could not be shorter than a month or six weeks at least because we were awaiting replies from bordeaux to the letters which we had written from cadiz 
however on account of the delicate state of my health i wished to be at le Bouille before the tenth of november my husband went the following day to see the ambassador of the directory to have his passport put in order as he still preserved a very vivid recollection of the reception of the citizen the former comte au marquis de roxante he was very agreeably surprised by the kind reception of the ambassador he was the general later the marechal perignon formerly under the command of my father he had received from him assistance which advanced his career not having forgotten this he was full of politeness for my husband nevertheless his gratitude did not go so far as to honour me with his visit the seigneurs of other days were not yet in fashion as they became later on we remained six weeks at madrid during which time we were overwhelmed with the thoughtfulness the attentions and the kindness of the langton and andilia families the son-in-law of madame langton monsieur brown whose wife had died the preceding year conducted us to all the most interesting parts of the city and every evening madame d'andilla took us to the corso then to take an ice in a fashionable cafe at the end of the rue d'alcala monsieur brown showed us the portrait of his wife she had been as beautiful if not more beautiful than her sisters and he could not be consoled for her loss at the age of twenty-two years End of part two, chapter five B. Part two, chapter six of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Seventeen ninety six, seventeen ninety seven. Visit to Paris. Finally, we received a letter from Bonny stating the day that he would await us at Bayonne, and this time we engaged a little collieres to transport ourselves and our baggage. Monsieur de Lavo, who had received word that his name had been erased from the list of emigres, proposed to accompany us, and we consented, although this was not at all agreeable to us. Monsieur de Chambeau was obliged to remain at Madrid. The tender friendship which he bore us, and of which he had given us many proofs, rendered this separation very painful for him and for us. For a period of three years he had shared all of our vicissitudes, our interests and our troubles. My husband considered him as a brother. During the long years of exile our thoughts had been the same. Thus our departure was a sad blow to our poor friend. He had no money, as no one had thought to send him any. We were happy to be in a position to leave him fifty louis, and he was fortunate enough to be welcomed in the house of the Comtesse de Calves, where he remained until 1800. We left Madrid at two o'clock in the afternoon to spend the night at the Escurial. The Collieres was a fine old Berlin, drawn by seven mules, which were conducted or rather counselled and exhorted by a coachman seated upon the box and by an assistant postillion armed with a long whip the latter sprang alternately from one to the other of the mules who had no bridles and obeyed only his voice however i think that the mules at the pole had reins but the five others certainly not one of them the seventh marched alone in front she was named the Generale and guided all the others at a quarter of a league from madrid the coachman perceived that he had forgotten his mantle in spite of the stifling heat he was not willing to go another step before the postillion had gone back to look for it mounted on one of the mules this delayed us much and we reached the escurial only late in the evening nearly all of the following day was consecrated to a visit to this admirable monastery of which so many descriptions have been written among all those which i have read since none has seemed to me perfectly exact they do not picture the kind of sad religious calm with which this place 
this chef d'oeuvre of all the arts in the midst of a desert imbues the soul so many marvellous things seem to have been brought together in this solitude only to recall to the mind the futility and the inutility of the works of man since then when the events which have distracted spain have been unrolled before me i have been struck by the prophecy of the father who showed us the subterranean chapel in which are buried the kings of spain since philip the second after having walked through the midst of these tombs all of which are similar he called our attention to one which remained empty that destined for the reigning king charles the fourth and at the same time placing his hand on the sarcophagus which was kept open by a wedge of marble he said to us in italian who knows whether he will ever occupy it at the moment this remark did not arrest my attention but long afterwards when i saw this unfortunate prince chased from his throne this prophetic speech returned to my mind since the discovery of america and of the gold and silver mines of peru the kings of spain have made every year to the church of the escorial a magnificent present of these two medals it thus happens that the treasury of the church has become the richest in all europe all of the articles provided by this luxurious custom arranged in order by years testified to an observing eye to the successive deterioration in taste from the first signed by benvenuto cellini to the last of very recent date the top of the high altar a bas-relief in solid silver representing the apotheosis of saint laurent patron of the escurial although of an unequal to magnificence was not satisfactory as a work of art i say was not for there is reason to suppose that the misfortunes of spain have led to the destruction of all these masterpieces the different objects used for the religious worship were arranged in armoire a glass made of the finest wood of the east indies i have preserved a clear recollection of a sacred ciborium ciboire in the form of a map of the world surmounted by a cross the middle of which was ornamented by an enormous diamond and the arms with four large pearls there were also monstrances ostensoir entirely covered with precious stones they showed us the ornament du jour de parc made of red velvet embroidered entirely with fine pearls of different sizes according to the design many persons would not perhaps have appreciated this magnificence for the smallest piece of stuff embossed with silver produced more effect nevertheless there were many million pearls upon these plain pieces of velvet we ascended to the rude loft jubay where we saw some admirable books of the church formed of leaves of vellum the margins of which were painted by the pupils of raphael from his designs these volumes in grand in folio ornamented with corners of silver bound in a brown skin showing the reverse side were placed in a kind of open case separated from one another by slender pieces of wood on account of their weight it would have been difficult to take them out of their case to obviate this inconvenience there was arranged at the bottom of each of the cases little ivory wheels traversed by iron pins around which they turned in this manner the slightest effort was enough to draw one of these books to you i have never seen this method employed in any other library in this high gallery of the escurial we found the magnificent christ in silver of life-size made by benvenuto cennini after having visited and admired this magnificent church i was left alone while my husband and monsieur de lavour went to visit the monastery and the library where they saw the beautiful picture of raphael named la vierge à la perle i had not been informed at madrid that a woman was not able to visit the library which was situated in the interior of the monastery without a special permit 
I regretted this greatly. During the long time that I awaited my travelling companions, I had time for my mind to become lost in many meditations. I thought of the beauty of this edifice, then of the Battle of St. Quentin, lost by the French on the 10th of August, 1557, the fete day of St. Laurent, in commemoration of which the Escorial was built by Philip II, the savage father of Don Carlos. So, when my husband returned and tapped me on the shoulder, saying, Let us go to see the house of the prince, I was almost vexed to have my thoughts disturbed. My son, being only a boy, had accompanied his father, and was very proud to be able to relate to me what he had seen. We then proceeded to this house of the prince, erected by Charles the Fourth while he was prince of the Astorias, and where he retired when the court was at the Escorial to escape from the rigorous Spanish etiquette. It resembled a very elegant little house which a modest broker would hardly be contented with in our day. Pretty furniture, little tables, ornaments of doubtful taste, a quantity of draperies of the most shabby effect gave it the appearance of a petit logis de fille. What a contrast with the admirable church which we had just left. It gave me a very disagreeable impression. Having returned to the inn, we at once set out to go to pass the night at La Granca, where the court was in residence at the royal chateau. Here we were to find dispatches from the American minister, Mr. Rutledge, for his consul at Bayonne. He invited us to supper, and the following day we set out for Segovie, a very picturesque little city, with the chateau of which we saw only the court, surrounded by arcades in the Moorish style. The remainder of our journey was very uneventful. We remained a day at Victoria to care for the Generala, without whom we could not proceed. Then a day at Burgos, where I went to see the cathedral, and finally we arrived at San Sebastian, where Bonnie awaited us. I felt no pleasure in returning to France. On the contrary, the sufferings which I had endured during the last six months of my sojourn had left in my mind a sentiment of terror and horror which I could not overcome. I thought that my husband was coming back with his fortune lost and that difficult affairs would occupy him disagreeably and that we were condemned to live in a large, devastated chateau where everything had been sold at Le Buil. My mother-in-law was still living she had again entered into possession of Tesson and Omleville. Without any intelligence, very suspicious, very obstinate, in business she had confidence in no one. How much I regretted my farm, my tranquillity. It was with a very heavy heart that I crossed to the bridge of the Bedesoa and realised that I was upon the territory of the Republic one and indivisible. We arrived at Bayonne in the evening. Hardly had we entered the inn when two members of the National Guard came to look for Monsieur de la Tour du Pin to take him before the authorities, represented then, it seems to me, by the President of the Department. This debut caused me great terror. Accompanied by Bonnie, he was conducted before the assembled members of the Tribunal, he was questioned as to his opinions, his plans, his actions, the causes and the reasons of his absence and those of his return. He at once perceived that he had been denounced by Monsieur de Roxante and declared so frankly, while stating at the same time how much on the other hand he had to praise in the attitude of the ambassador at Madrid. After a discussion which lasted at least two hours, my husband returned. They had authorised him to continue his route as far as Bordeaux, but armed with a kind of official itinerary in which the stops were indicated, and with the injunction to have this paper visaed at each place. 
Bonnie left us and returned to Bordeaux by the mail coach. We engaged a wretched driver who conducted us by short journeys. One event only marked our trip. At Mont de Masson, where I called a perruquier to dress my hair, he proposed to me, to my great surprise, to purchase my hair for two hundred francs. He said that blonde wigs were so much the fashion at Paris that he would certainly make a profit of at least a hundred francs if I would consent to sell him my hair. I refused this proposition, you may well believe, but I conceived a great respect for my hair, which was modesty apart, very handsome and very fine at that time. At Bordeaux we found again the excellent Broucon. He had prospered during the war against Spain and was now engaged in providing provisions for our armies in Italy. He received us with the tender friendship which had never for a moment changed. But I was impatient to be at home, and I made arrangements at once with my good Dr. Dupuy, who was to take care of me. Then the affair of raising the sequestration terminated, we went to Le Bouil to have the seals removed. The first moment, I admit, sorely tried my philosophy. I had left the house very well furnished, and if nothing very elegant was to be found there, at least everything was convenient and in sufficient quantity. I found it absolutely vacant. Not a chair to sit down on, not a table, not a bed. I was on the point of giving way to discouragement, but to complain would have been useless. At the farm, we set about unpacking our boxes, which had long since arrived at Bordeaux. And the sight of these simple little pieces of furniture transported to this vast chateau gave rise to many philosophical reflections. The next day, many of the inhabitants of saint Andre, ashamed of having purchased our furniture at auction, came to propose to us to resell it for the price which it had cost them. Under these reasonable conditions, we again came into possession of those articles which we needed most. One of the things which had the most value was the equipment of our kitchen, which was very fine. It had been transported to a district of Bourg, with the intention of sending it to the mint. This was resold to us, as well as the library, which had also been deposited in the district. We passed several days very agreeably in placing the books on the shelves, and before the arrival of Dr. Pouy, all of our interior arrangements had been finished, and we were as well installed as if we had been at Le Bouille for a year. At this moment, I experienced a great pleasure. This was the arrival of my dear maid Marguerite. Madame de Valence, when she was released from prison at Paris, had engaged her to take care of her two daughters, but as soon as this excellent maid heard of my return, nothing could prevent her from coming to rejoin me. In spite of the aristocracy of her white apron, she had escaped from the dangers of the terror. She arrived at Le Bouille in time to be present at the birth of my dear daughter Charlotte, who was born the 4th of November, 1796. I gave her the name of Charlotte because she was the goddaughter of Monsieur de Chambord. Nevertheless, upon the registry of the commune, she was inscribed under the name of Alex, which consequently was the only name she was able to use legally. When I was up again in the month of December, my husband started to make a circular trip to Tesson, Ombleville and La Roche Chalet, where there remained to us only some old ruined towers from the 20,000 francs of quit rent and rents which this land was worth. I remained alone in the large chateau of Le Bouille with Marguerite, two servants, and old Biquet, who got drunk every night. The peasants in the farmyard were far away, only some wretched planks closed the part of the ground floor which was not yet finished. This was the time when troops of brigands called chauffeurs spread terror in all the southern part of France. Every day new horrors were recounted regarding them. 
I admit to my shame that I was cold with terror. It seems to me that I never in my life passed a time more painful. How much I regretted my farm, my good negroes, and my tranquillity of other days. Our affairs, which were far from taking a favourable turn, also constantly preoccupied me. My husband had been advised not to accept the inheritance of his father except sous bénéfice d'inventaire, that is to say, in reserving the right to verify the charges or costs. Would to God that he had done so, but the sad manner in which we had lost my father-in-law and the profound respect which my husband had for his memory deterred him from adopting this course. This inheritance comprised the estate of Le Buil, several pieces of property in La Roche Chalet, and our rights to the fortune of my mother-in-law, which had formed part of our marriage contract. I will not enter into the details of our ruin, the recollection of which escapes me now, and which, besides, I have never clearly understood. I only know that at the time of our marriage, my father-in-law was supposed to have an income of 80,000 francs, Without going into further details, it may be said that our loss in all amounted to nearly 60,000 francs of income. To this can be added the house at Saint, a fine dwelling in a perfect state of repair, and which could have been rented for 3,000 francs. The authorities of the department had occupied it, and when at the end of several years it was returned to us, it was in such a state of dilapidation that it had lost its entire value. We also lost the furniture of the Chateau of Tesson, which Monsieur de Montconseil had left to my father-in-law. This furniture was sold at the same time as that of Le Buil, that is to say, during the months which elapsed between the epoch of the condemnation followed by the execution of my father-in-law and the date of the decree which restored the property of the persons condemned to their children. It can be said that it was during this period of several months that nearly all the furniture of the Chateau of France had been sold. It is necessary, however, to accept the libraries, which after having been transported to the chief places of the district, were subsequently restored to their owners. These sales struck the most disastrous blow to family souvenirs, and it is incontestable that the sudden dispersion of all these souvenirs of the paternal roof contributed strongly to the demoralisation of the young noblesse. We remained at Le Buil the whole winter and a part of the spring. About the month of July, 1797, my husband recognised the necessity of going to Paris to terminate his arrangements with Monsieur de Lamette. As if inspired by presentiment, I requested to accompany him. Madame de Montesson, who was still full of kindness for me, arranged with Madame de Valence that I should live in her house at Paris. She herself was established for the summer in the country, in a house which she had just purchased near Saint-Denis. The six weeks which we expected to pass at Paris before returning to Le Wheel for the harvest of the grapes did not require any great quantity of baggage. We therefore transported only what was strictly necessary for us and our children. A large number of émigrés had returned under borrowed names. Madame de Nîn, who had come back under the name of a milliner of Geneva, Mademoiselle Bautier, was situated with Madame de Poix at Saint-Ouane. Madame de Stahl, protected by Barris, the director, and many others were at Paris. Monsieur de Talleyrand had summoned us to come to Paris, and had particularly urged my husband to come there. People had commenced to speak of a counter-revolution, in which everybody believed. The government had been formed, and two assemblies, the Council of the Five Hundred and that of the Ancients comprised many royalists. The Salon of Barra, the influential director of which the Duchesse de Brancard did the honours, was full of them. 
and although the other directors did not seem disposed to follow the example of their colleague it is certain that never had the bourbon cause had so much chance of success as at this epoch we set out in a sort of little carriage my husband myself my maid marguerite and our two children Humbert, seven and a half years of age and charlotte who was only eight months old we passed several days at tesson where we found the chateau in a terrible state of dilapidation they had not only carried off the furniture but had destroyed the papers taken away the locks of many of the doors the blinds of several windows, the irons of the kitchen, and the bars of the furnaces. It was a regular devastation. Fortunately, Gregoire had piled upon his bed, and those of his wife and daughter, as many mattresses as he had been able to save, and these served as beds for us during our sojourn at Tesson. My emotion was vivid in finding again this good family of Grégoire, who had concealed my husband with so much care and devotion. Before this, in passing by Mirambeau, I had seen the locksmith Potier and his wife, with whom my husband had remained three months, shut up in a hole where there was not enough light to read by. How I again rendered thanks to God that he had permitted him to escape from all the frightful times of the terror. We finally arrived at the end of our journey. Madame de Valence received me with pleasure, and Madame de Montesson, who was not yet in the country, greeted me with a thousand acts of kindness. At Paris, any little thing out of the ordinary always attracts attention. Accordingly, I made a hit immediately on our arrival. As my husband and I were taking supper in the room of Madame de Valence, Monsieur de Talleyrand was announced. He was very glad to see us, and at the end of a moment he said, Eh bien, gouverné, qu'est-ce que vous comptez faire? Moi, replied Monsieur de la Tour du Pain with surprise, mais je viens pour arranger mes affaires. Ah, said Monsieur de Talleyrand, je croyais... Then he changed the conversation, and spoke of indifferent matters several moments later addressing madame de valence he began to say with that air of nonchalance which it is necessary to have seen to understand a propos vous savez que le ministère est changé le nouveau ministre sont nommé ah said she et que sont ils then after a moment of hesitation as if he had forgotten the names and was trying to recall them he said Ah oui, voici un tel à la guerre, un tel à la marine, un tel aux finances, et aux affaires étrangères, said I. Ah, aux affaires étrangères? Eh, mais, moi, sans doute. Then, taking his hat, he went away. We looked at each other, my husband and myself, without surprise for nothing could be surprising in the case of Monsieur de Talleyrand, except an act on his part of bad taste. He remained eminently the grand seigneur while serving a government composed of the refuse of the rabble. The next day found him established at the Office of Foreign Affairs as if he had occupied this post for the past ten years. The intervention of Madame de Stael all powerful at this moment with Benjamin Constant, had made him minister. He had gone to her house and, throwing upon the table his purse, which contained only a few louis, had said, Voilà le reste de ma fortune. Demain, ministre, ou je me brûle la cervelle. None of these words were true, but it was dramatic, and Madame de Stael loved that. Besides, the nomination was not difficult to arrange. The directors, and above all Barra, were very much honoured to have such a minister. I will not relate here the history of the 18th Fructidor. You can read it in all the memoirs of the time. The royalists had a great deal of hope, and the different intrigues were mixed up in every sense of the word. 
Many of the emigres had returned. They wore the rallying signs, all of which were perfectly known to the police, the collar of the coat of black velvet, the knot, in I know not what form, in the corner of the handkerchief, and so on. It was by absurdities of this kind that they thought to save France. Madame de Montesson returned from the country expressly to give a dinner to the deputies who were well disposed. Monsieur de Bouchon, our excellent friend, was also one of the hosts of these dinners, where they talked with an unbelievable imprudence. We met again every day, my husband and I, some people of our acquaintance, and the originality of the life which I had led in America, and the desire which I evinced of returning there, rendered me for a month very much in vogue. Madame Denis, our aunt, had returned, as I have already said, under a borrowed name with a Geneva passport. She was living with Madame de Poix, who herself was installed for the duration of the summer in a house which she had borrowed at Saint-Ouen. We went there to pass several days, to the great pleasure of Humbert, who was very much bored at Paris, where he was not able to go out. I also saw Madame de Stal nearly every day. In spite of her liaison, more than intimate, with Benjamin Constant, she was working for the Royalist Party. You may well believe that my first care on arriving at Paris was to go to see Madame Tallien, to whom we owed our life. I found her established in a little house called La Chaumière, at the end of the Cour la Reine. She received me with much affection, and wished immediately to explain how it happened that she had found herself under the necessity of marrying Tallien, by whom she had a child. Her family life with this new husband already seemed insupportable. Nothing could equal, it seemed, his distrustful and suspicious character. She related to me that one night, when she had returned at one o'clock in the morning, he had such an attack of jealousy that he had been on the point of killing her. Seeing him armed with a pistol, she had taken flight, and had gone to demand asylum and protection from Monsieur Martel, whose life she had saved at Bordeaux, but he had refused to receive her. She wept bitterly in recounting to me this act of ingratitude. Therefore my gratitude, which I expressed with warmth, as indeed I felt it, seemed very sweet to her. Tallien came for a moment to his wife's room. I thanked him quite coldly, and he told me to count on him under all circumstances. You will see later on in what way and in what manner he kept his word. End of part two, chapter six. Part two, chapter seven A of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording, or LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1797 to 1798, Exile in England. My husband was busy with his affairs, and had undertaken negotiations to repurchase a part of the estate of Hautefontaine, which had been sold, when one morning at daybreak, the 18th Fructidor, the 4th of September, 1797, I thought I heard upon the boulevard a noise of artillery carriages. As my room looked out on the court, I told Marguerite to go to the window of the salle à manger to see what was going on. On her return, she told me that the boulevard was filled with a number of generals, with troops and cannon. I arose as soon as possible and sent to awaken my husband, who was sleeping in the room above mine, we both went to the window, where a short time later we were joined by Madame de Valence. Augereau was there, giving orders. The Rue de Capucine and the Rue Neuve du Luxembourg were barricaded. Towards midday, as nobody had brought us any news, Madame de Valence and I, inspired by curiosity, went out, quietly dressed, in order not to be remarked, with the intention of going to see Madame de Stael. 
as the streets above mentioned were barricaded by pieces of cannon and the rue de la paix was not in existence at that period we were obliged to ascend as far as the rue de richelieu to find a free passage all the shops were closed there were a good many people out but no one was talking finally we arrived at the residence of madame de stal she was with benjamin constant and very much incensed with him because he maintained that the directory in arresting the deputies had only performed an indispensable coup d'etat from monsieur constant we learned that all of the emigres who had returned had received an order once more to leave france under pain of being judged by military commissions this news filled me with consternation and i hastened to return home to inform my husband on arriving i found my husband very much perplexed as to the means of notifying my aunt of these events she was living at saint ouen and the gates of paris were closed no one was able to pass the barriers without a special permission by a singular piece of good fortune i met madame de pontecoulon whom i knew as i had often seen her with madame de valence i will tell later on who she was as she had a permit of the section for herself and her maid she was able to go to saint denis where her country house was located i begged her to let me take the place of the maid and with her usual kindness she consented you can easily imagine with what exclamations i was received by madame de poix and my aunt the latter decided to leave at once for england with these ladies were several former emigres who were in despair of the necessity of once more leaving france by the terms of the decree all the emigres who had returned upon french territory were ordered to leave paris within twenty-four hours and france within a week my idea was to return at once to le Bouil. having left france with a proper passport and having returned with this same passport duly visaed by the french authorities in the united states and in spain i thought that the decree could not apply to us as we had not returned secretly to assure himself on this point my husband went to find monsieur de talleyrand the latter very much occupied with his own future was not giving much thought to that of others he at once replied without hesitation that it was not his affair and told us to submit the case to sautin the minister of police i accordingly went to see talleyrand who received me very cordially he promised to go at once to see Sautin, to have him annotate the paper without which we could not have visaed the passport of the municipality of saint andre de Cubzac, with which we had come to Paris, and which we must have in our possession in order to pass the barriers. I came home quite disturbed, and commenced to pack my trunks. A police decree had just been posted, ordering all proprietors to send in a report as to the persons living in the houses who were at paris without papers in regular order we were unwilling to cause any trouble to madame de montesson with whom we were lodging finally after a trying delay of several hours talleyrand sent me back the request which he had submitted to the inspection of sautin the minister had added with his own hand and signed the following annotation this private individual is within the law talleyrand in the note which he wrote me at the same time in the third person excused himself politely for not having been able to obtain anything but the end of his note could be translated by the words i wish you a bon voyage there were two alternatives from which to choose we could ask for a passport for spain and proceed to le Bouille, 
where I could remain some time while my husband went to St. Sebastien. This would have been the wisest course. We could also go to England, and from there, according to circumstances, return to America. My aunt, Madame Denine, had much influence with my husband, and she induced him to adopt the latter course. We had very little money, but were assured of finding at London my stepmother, Madame Dillon, and many other very close relations who, without doubt, would be disposed to come to our aid. We therefore decided to leave for England. Having come to Paris with the intention of remaining only five or six weeks, we had brought with us only the most necessary baggage. I had, in addition, several dresses which I had had made at Paris. Two very small trunks contained all of our baggage, including that of my maid Marguerite, who had decided this time not to leave us. This departure was destined to have the most unfortunate consequences for us. We were in negotiations with the new owners of Hautefontaine to repurchase the property, but this new emigration put an end to all of our arrangements. The two or three days which preceded our departure were passed in a state of sadness and disquietude. Perhaps it would have been better for us to have returned at a wheel. The report was current that Barras, who had yielded for the moment to the demands of his colleagues, would soon regain his authority and at the same time resume his favourable disposition regarding the émigrés. Everywhere you met people who were in despair over this new emigration. We reserved three places in a carriage which was to take us in three days to Calais. Two other places were occupied by Monsieur de Beauvau and by a cousin of Madame de Valence, the young César Ducrest, an amiable young man who was destined to perish so miserably several years later. The French are naturally light-hearted, so in spite of the fact that we were all in despair, ruined, furious, we found nevertheless the means of being in good humour and of laughing. Monsieur de Beauvau, our cousin, was going to rejoin his wife, who had been a Mademoiselle de Mortemar, and his three or four children. She was living in a country house at Staines, near Windsor, with her grandfather, the Duc d'Arcourt, formerly governor of the first Dauphin, who died at Meudon in 1789. Madame de Beauvau was the youngest of the three granddaughters of the Duc d'Arcourt. Their mother had married the Duc de Mautemar and had died long before the Revolution. Monsieur de Mautemar had then married a Mademoiselle de Prisac, the mother of the present Duke. We appeared before all the municipalities in the localities situated on the route, including those of Calais, where we embarked on the packet one evening at eleven o'clock. I was seated upon the deck, holding my daughter in my arms, while Marguerite was occupied in putting my son to bed, and my husband was suffering as usual from seasickness, although there was little wind and the night was superb. Beside me was a gentleman who, seeing me embarrassed with my child, proposed to me with an English accent that I should lean against him as I turned to thank him, he saw my face in the moonlight and cried, Bon Dieu, est-ce que possible? It was young Jeffreys, son of the editor of the Edinburgh Review. I had seen him every day at Boston at his uncle's at the time of our sojourn in that hospitable city three years before. We talked much of America and of the regret which I had felt in leaving it. I gave him to understand that in spite of the presence of all my family in England, I was going there inspired only by the desire and the plan of returning to my farm, if all hope of a return to France vanished, or at least became indefinite. The night passed in talking of England with my companion, and the first rays of the sun revealed to us the white cliffs of England 
to which a strong southeast wind had brought us near. We landed to find ourselves handed over to the brutality of the English customs officers, who seemed to me worse even than those of Spain. At the sight of my passport, which I presented at the alien office, I was asked if I was a subject of the King of England, and upon my affirmative reply they told me that I should give as reference some person who was known in England. Having named without hesitation my three uncles, Lord Dillon, Lord Kenmare, and Sir William Jerningham, the tone and manner of these employés changed very quickly. These details took up the morning. After an English luncheon, or rather dinner, we left Dover for London. We spent the night at Canterbury, or at Rochester, my recollections are not very precise as to the locality, and the following morning we arrived at London, and went to one of the inns in Piccadilly. As I had written my aunt, Lady Jerningham, from Dover to announce our arrival, she had sent her son Edward to bring us to her house in Bolton Row. Her reception was entirely maternal. She immediately informed us of her departure for her country place at Cossey, where she said she expected to stay at least six months. She invited us to come and pass this time with her. My good aunt was particularly amiable towards my husband, and being very fond of children, she conceived at once a great affection for Umbert. We therefore took up our residence in Bolton Row like children of the family. Here I found again my excellent old friend, the Chevalier Jerningham, brother of Sir William, the husband of my aunt. The faithful friendship which he had shown me since my childhood was as sweet as it was useful during my sojourn in England. I was arranging to go to see my stepmother, Madame Dillon, who had been living in England for two years, when she came to see my aunt. My arrival in London was an event in the family. Here I met again Betsy de la Touche, the daughter of my stepmother. She had been confided to my care in 1789 and 1790, when she was at the convent of the Assumption, where I often went to see her, and whence I alone had permission to take her out from time to time. She had married Edward de Fitz James. She was a very sweet and amiable young woman, worthy of all good fortune. She was passionately fond of her husband, who did not return her affection, and his cruel and public infidelities had broken her heart. Alexandre de la Touche, her brother, was three years younger than herself. He was a handsome young man, light-headed, gay, but with little mind and still less education. He had all the whims of the young émigrés who had nothing to do, was destitute of any talent, loved horses, society and small intrigues, but never opened a book. My stepmother, who as long as I knew her, never had a book on the table, could not have given him any taste for reading. She herself was not lacking in natural intelligence, and had good manners and was well-bred. Nevertheless, I have often asked myself why my father, who was endowed with a superior mind, and was a man of fine education, had married a woman older than himself. It is true that she was rich, but nevertheless, she could not pass for being what was called an heiress. Although he desired a son above all things, they had only three daughters. Two died as small children, and only the eldest, Fanny, survived. My uncle, the Archbishop, and my grandmother were living in London. I had not seen them since my departure from their house in 1788. My aunt, Lady Jerningham, thought that I would do well to pay them my respects and the good Chevalier, her brother-in-law, undertook to ask them if they would consent to receive me. My grandmother, seeing that the Archbishop desired it, 
dared not offer any opposition. At the same time, she made a condition that my husband should not accompany me. I could have made this condition a pretext for not going to see them, but I feigned ignorance. My husband, besides, was very happy to be relieved of this visit, for even at this time, he confessed to me later, he knew that my grandmother had spoken very unkindly of him since she had been in London. If I had known this at the time, I should certainly have refrained from going to see her. One morning, therefore, I turned my steps towards Thayer Street with my little Umbert. It was not without an emotion mingled with many different feelings that I knocked at the door of this modest mansion inhabited by my uncle and my grandmother. The house seemed to me to take the place without transition of the fine hotel of the Faubourg Saint-Germain where I had passed my childhood, surrounded by the luxury and the splendour which can be obtained in life with an income of 400,000 francs, which the Archbishop of Narbonne enjoyed at that time. An old domestic opened the door for me. On seeing me, he burst into tears. He was one of the servants of Hautefontaine, where he had been present at my marriage. He preceded me, and I heard him announce me in a voice full of emotion, saying, Here is Madame de Gouvernet. My grandmother arose and came to meet me. I kissed her hand. Her reception was very cold, and she called me Madame. At the same moment, the Archbishop entered, and throwing his arms around my neck, he kissed me tenderly, and then, seeing my son, he embraced him several times. He addressed several questions in English and in French to the boy, he replied with an intelligence which charmed my uncle. My uncle invited me to come to dinner the following day with six old bishops from Languedoc, whom he had taken en pension at his table. They were all former acquaintances of mine. As for my husband, he was not mentioned. I announced my plan to go and visit my aunt at Cossy during the period of her sojourn there. The Archbishop expressed his satisfaction, but my grandmother was certainly much put out. End of Part 2, Chapter 7a Part 2, Chapter 7b of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Lady Jerningham, who had been very anxious as to the result of my visit, was happy that everything had gone so well. The following day my aunt took me to see two other uncles. One was Lord Dillon, elder brother of my father. He lived in a handsome mansion in Portman Square with his second wife, two of her daughters, and a young son, eight or nine years of age, who was a beautiful boy. Lady Dillon had been a Mademoiselle Rogier of Belgian origin. She had all the appearance of what she was in reality, a former actress. She had been the mistress of my uncle before his marriage to Miss Phipps, daughter of Lord Mulgrave. From this liaison had been born a son who, according to the custom allowed in England among the Protestants, had been authorised to bear the name of his father. As I have already stated at the commencement of these recollections, Lord Dillon, at the time he bore only the title of the Honourable Charles Dillon, was a gambler and a spendthrift, and was loaded with debt. He abjured the religion of his fathers to become a Protestant at the instigation of his granduncle Robert Lee, fourth and last Earl of Lichfield, who had demanded this as the price of his inheritance an income of fifteen thousand pounds sterling and the beautiful castle of ditchley assured of this handsome fortune and wishing to have an heir he married a protestant miss phipps and made her so unhappy that she died at the age of twenty-five years leaving him a son 
Henry Augustus, who later became Viscount Dillon, and a daughter who married Sir Thomas Webb. My uncle then lived openly with Mademoiselle Roger, by whom he had had two daughters during the life of his wife. After his wife's death, he publicly married her. His sister, Lady Jerningham, was extremely dissatisfied, and to appease her, he confided to her his legitimate daughter to bring up, and only kept with him the two bastards. These used his name, with this difference, that they did not put upon their visiting cards Honourable Miss Dillon, but Miss Dillon only. They were both charming girls, pretty and well brought up. One died at the age of eighteen, and the other married Lord Frederick Beauclerc, brother of the Duke of St. Albans. As my aunt was not particularly anxious to see Lady Dillon, I went to her house with her daughter, Lady Biddingfeld, my cousin, who was at that time in London for several days. Lord Dillon received us very politely, but as a man of the world, without showing the least interest. He offered us his box for the opera for the same evening, and we accepted. This was the only benefit that I received from him. He gave a pension of a thousand pounds sterling to his uncle, the Archbishop, who was eighty years of age. As far as I was concerned, although I was the daughter of his brother, he never came to my aid during the two and a half years I passed in England. The second uncle whom I visited, this time with Lady Jerningham, was Lord Ken Mayer, who had formerly borne the name of Valentine Brown. He received me in a very different manner, although I was his niece only by his first wife a sister of my father, who had been dead for many years. He was then remarried. By his first wife he had a daughter, Lady Charlotte Brown, who was accordingly my cousin. She later became by marriage Lady Charlotte Gould. Lord Kenmare, his daughter and all his family, received me with the greatest kindness and goodness, and the friendship of Lady Charlotte in particular has never become cold. She was then eighteen years of age, and had many aspirants for her hand, as she had a fortune of twenty thousand pounds sterling. I went to see my aunt, Madame Denin, at Richmond. She was much displeased with our plan of passing some time at Cossey with Lady Jerningham. Madame Denin was exceedingly domineering, even to the point of tyranny and everything which brought the slightest umbrage to her empire put her out to a most unreasonable degree. Her authority was exercised principally upon Monsieur de Lally, although it must be admitted that she was very useful to him through the firmness and decision of her character. But she did not suffer any rival, and Monsieur de Lally had committed the imprudence during the two or three months that Madame Denin had passed in France of going to Cossy, where he had enjoyed himself like a schoolboy on his vacation. Madame Denin had accordingly conceived a great aversion for Lady Jerningham. Accordingly, on learning that her nephew, Monsieur de La Tour du Pin, and I had formed the project of passing six months in the country with Lady Jerningham, she had a feeling of vexation which she did not try to dissimulate. In spite of her character, Madame Denis nevertheless did not like a spirit of justice. She was forced to admit that, having arrived in England without resources, it was very natural for us to accept with pleasure an invitation from a relative so near and so highly considered in the world as my aunt Jerningham. Madame Denis and Monsieur de Lally had an establishment in common. The age of the two should have prevented the public from finding any scandalous motive in this association. Nevertheless, people turned the matter into ridicule. Madame Denis, in spite of her real and great qualities, was not generally liked. After a residence of three days at London, I realised that I would not have any pleasure in staying there longer. 
the society of the emigres their gossip their little intrigues and slander had rendered my sojourn disagreeable finally to my great joy the time came for our departure for cossey lady jerningham had preceded us to the country it was therefore arranged that i should stay with my stepmother madame dillon for several days there i learned with great satisfaction that edward de fitzjames had some saddle horses as i had the reputation of being an excellent horsewoman he procured for me a side saddle my stepmother gave me a fine equestrian habit and every day we took long rides we set out from london like a caravan my stepmother myself my daughter my son my maid marguerite and flora the coloured maid of madame dillon in one berlin madame de fitzjames alexandre de la touche and my husband in another then followed the aged governess of betsy and finally monsieur de fitzjames his horses grooms and so on we stopped for the night at newmarket where i held the famous horse races which i was very curious to see we remained here all the next day it was the last day of the races and one on which was run the royal cup we passed the whole day upon the turf and by good chance quite rare in england the weather was very fine i have guarded the memory of this day as one of those in my life when i was the most amused and interested the following day we set out to arrive for the night at cossey it was i think during the first days of october seventeen ninety seven my aunt who was very fond of children took possession of umbert every morning after breakfast she took him to her room and kept him all the morning occupied in giving him lessons and making him read and write in english and in french his toilette also was the object of her care she furnished him with suits overcoats linen and a complete child's wardrobe she was also extremely kind to me having observed that i was able to make my dresses myself under the pretext of inspiring in fanny dillon a love of work she brought to my room and placed at my disposal pieces of muslin and material of every kind an attention which was all the more agreeable as i had arrived from france very lightly dressed for the climate of england my aunt had learned that my children had not been inoculated vaccination having then only recently been discovered and she took charge of supplying this omission and had her own surgeon come from norwich to perform the operation in fine she surrounded us with care of every kind and the time which i passed at cossey was as agreeable as we could possibly have wished sir william possessed an income estimated at eighteen thousand pounds sterling which does not constitute a large fortune in england but was sufficient to enable him to live handsomely his house was old but convenient the chapel in which the chaplain officiated was installed in the garret following the usage of the catholics prior to the emancipation the winter passed very agreeably towards the month of march madame dillon my sister fanny and monsieur and madame de fitzjames returned to london but we remained at cossey until the month of may as my aunt was to pass the summer at london sir william proposed to us to take possession during the period of his absence of a pretty cottage which he had built in the park i preferred however not to remain there alone and furthermore madame denin was very much enraged at the idea of the prolongation of our sojourn in the country and insisted on having us with her at richmond where she could give us lodging we therefore agreed to go there and rejoin her although it was much against my desire but my husband did not wish to disoblige his aunt and besides this we had some business in london about which i am going to speak as i have not re-read the first part of these recollections i am not certain that i stated that 
at the time of my arrival at Boston, I had written my excellent instructor, Monsieur Combe, who was then living with my stepmother at Martinique. My father had given him a good position, that of recorder of the island. He had exercised this function at St. Christophe and Tobago, and living in the house, he had been able to accumulate his salary until it amounted to the sum of 60,000 francs. Madame Dillon had borrowed this capital from him, agreeing to pay him interest. When Monsieur Combe learned at Martinique of our arrival at Boston, and also of our intention to buy property, the excellent man who loved me like a father had the thought of joining this sum, his entire fortune, to the funds which we possessed, in order to permit us to acquire a more considerable establishment where he would come to be with us and pass the rest of his days. He therefore asked Madame Dillon to repay the capital which he had loaned her. She not only refused his demand, but she also would not set the time when she would repay his money. He was in despair over the failure of his plans, and prayed and menaced Madame Dillon, but all without effect. Every vessel which came from Martinique to the United States brought me a letter from him. He wrote that he did not dare to leave Madame Dillon, hoping that by his presence he would finally succeed in obtaining his money. In the midst of all this, Madame Dillon left for England. Before her departure, poor Monsieur Combe, who remained at Martinique, succeeded in obtaining a paper in due form acknowledging the debt of 60,000 francs of capital and the interest which then amounted to nearly 10,000 francs in addition. Upon my arrival at Richmond, I received the sad news of the death of my old friend. A short time before, in his last letter, he told me that the climate of the islands, and still more the chagrin at knowing that I was once again in France without resources, was killing him. He added that he was writing to Madame Dillon requesting her to pay me the interest of the capital of 70,000 francs which she owed him. By will, in legal form, he left me his credit of 70,000 francs on Madame Dillon as well as the running income which amounted to 15 or 18,000 francs. From the very day that she knew of this legacy, the attitude of Madame Dillon towards us completely changed. She kept a fine house at London and spent freely in dinners and evening entertainments. But if we had need of money, she referred us to a Creole emigre who was charged with the care of her affairs. To all our demands with the object of having her fix a date when she would pay the interest of our credit, she replied evasively. One time, there was no sale for her sugar. Another time, her funds had not been received. In short, every day some new excuse was offered. Having addressed myself directly to her, I was very badly received. We spoke of the matter to her son, Alexandre de la Touche. My husband also took the matter up with her man of affairs. But all of our attempts remained without success. The money which we received was given us like arms, though it came from our own property. Nevertheless, it was necessary for us to pay our part of the expenses with Madame Denin, and this constituted for us a new cause of embarrassment. How many times I regretted that I had not remained at Cossy. Our participation in the household of Madame Dinine was to me insupportable. She had given us such bad quarters that we were not able to receive anyone. Our lodging comprised only two small bedrooms on the ground floor. And in England it is not customary to receive visitors in your bedrooms. I occupied one of these rooms with my daughter and my husband the other with our son. In the evening only we found our aunt, 
in a handsome salon which she had on the first floor. It was very inconvenient, certainly, but if our life had been pleasant, I would not have been disturbed. While admitting the great and fine qualities of Madame Denis, and never failing to show her the respect which I owed her, I was forced nevertheless to recognise that our characters were not sympathetic. Perhaps it was my fault, and I should have remained insensible to the thousand pinpricks which she gave me. Monsieur de Lally, the most timid of men, would not have dared to venture the least drollery which might have amused me. I was still young and gay. At twenty-eight years of age, how could I have the severity of mien imposed by the fifty years of my aunt? Absorbed in politics, the only thing which interested her was the constitution which it was necessary to give to France. This bored me to death. And then came the writings of Monsieur Lally, which it was necessary to read and re-read, word by word, phrase by phrase. In fine, I aspired to have a household of my own, no matter how small it might be. As I could not see any opportunity, I was resigned. End of part two, chapter seven B. Part two, chapter eight of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Seventeen ninety eight to seventeen ninety nine. Life at Richmond. It was at the beginning of the summer of 1798 that the Princesse de Bouillon, of whom I have spoken at the commencement of these recollections, came to England to arrange the affairs of an inheritance which had been left her by her friend, the Duchesse de Biron. If I am not mistaken, the sum involved was 600,000 francs in English funds. Madame de Bouillon was a German Princesse de Hesse Rottenburg although she had passed her life in France, where she married the cripple who had never been her husband except in name. Joined by a long and faithful attachment to Prince Emmanuel de Zarm, she had had a daughter who was brought up under the name of Theresia. During the emigration, this daughter had married a young councillor of the Parliament of Aix, who has since become well known, Monsieur de Vitrolle. One morning, after my aunt had gone to make a call on Madame de Bouillon, I saw these two ladies return together. Several moments later, Madame Denis entered my room, accompanied by my husband. We have arranged for you, she said. Monsieur de Vitrolle is going away, and Madame de Bouillon does not wish to remain alone in her lodging, although she has it at her disposal for three months still. She wishes to give it up to you in exchange for your own. You'll be much more comfortable there. A sign from my husband gave me to understand that I ought to accept this proposition. I therefore moved to the dwelling of Madame de Bouillon, and here was born a boy to whom we gave the name of Edward, as he was the godson of Lady Jerningham and her son Edward. The good Chevalier Jerningham came to see me and said that my aunt, his sister-in-law, thought that with three children I could not, when I left my present residence, return to the two little rooms of the modest lodging which I had occupied with Madame Denine. He had therefore undertaken to find a small house at Richmond where we would be at home. His search had succeeded beyond anything we could have hoped for. The house belonged to a former actress of Drury Lane, who had been at one time very beautiful and very popular. She never occupied it, but the dwelling was so neat and well kept that she was not anxious to lease it. However, the eloquence of the Chevalier and the forty-five pounds sterling offered as rent by Lady Jerningham decided her. This little house, which was a real jewel, was only fifteen feet wide. On the ground floor was a hall, 
a pretty salon with two windows, and then a stairway which was hardly visible. The first floor comprised two charming bedrooms, and the floor above two other rooms for servants. At the end of the hall, on the ground floor, was a nice kitchen, which looked out on a miniature garden, with only a path and two flower beds. There were rugs everywhere, and a fine English oilcloth in the passageways and upon the staircase. Nothing could have been more attractive, cleaner, and more gracefully furnished than this little house, which could have all been put in a room of medium size. However, I was very unhappy in taking possession, for that very day I lost my little boy, aged three months. He was carried off in a moment by an attack of pleurisy, which I attributed to the neglect of the English maid who cared for him. I was very ill and almost dying when I took possession of the little house with my two surviving children, Humbert and Charlotte. Having only these two children to look after, we discharged our English servant. My maid Marguerite had learned a little cooking during my absence in the United States, and she very willingly placed her experience, and above all her zeal, at our disposal. England, where there are fortunes so immense, existences so luxurious, is at the same time the country in the world where poor people can live in the most comfortable manner. For instance, there is no necessity for going to market. The butcher never fails a single day to come at a fixed hour, crying, Butcher, at your door. You open the door and tell him what you want. Is it a leg of lamb? He brings it all arranged, ready to put upon the spit. Is it lamb chops? They are arranged on a little wooden platter which he calls for the following day. On a slip of paper are written the weight and the price. About this time, as Madame Dillon refused to pay our income, we found ourselves much embarrassed. All the money which we had on hand was five or six hundred francs, and when this sum was spent, we did not know what we could do, not for a lodging, for our little house cost us nothing, but literally for food. My friend Chevalier Jerningham had informed me that my uncle Lord Dillon had refused with the greatest severity to come to our aid. In addition to this, all communications had ceased with France. At this moment, we received from Monsieur de Chambeau, who was still living in Spain, a despondent letter in which he said that he had no news from France and that nobody had sent him a sou. His uncle, the former fermier general of whom he was the sole heir, had just died after having made a will in his favour, but the government had confiscated the inheritance on the ground that he was an émigré. The day that he wrote us, a last Louis composed his entire fortune, and he could no longer count upon his friends in Spain, whose goodwill he had already exhausted. Upon receiving this letter, my husband did not hesitate a moment to share with his friend the last of his funds. He rushed to a banker where he purchased a draft for ten pounds sterling, payable to bearer. The same day he sent it to Madrid. This was nearly a half of our own resources. There remained with us only twelve pounds sterling on hand, without any other resources to pay our bills when this sum was spent. We were not willing to ask the aid afforded by the English government to the emigres on account of my family and above all on account of Lady Jerningham. So far as Lord Dillon was concerned, I had no scruples of any kind. Out of respect for the memory of my father, I did not wish to declare publicly that his widow, Madame Dillon, my stepmother, who was proprietor of a house at London, where she gave dinners and evening entertainments, had refused to come to my succour. A last five-pound note was all we had left when one morning, my good cousin, Edward Jerningham, came to see me. He was a charming young man who had just passed his twenty-first birthday. He well justified the passionate love which his mother felt for him. 
As he arose to leave, I went to the door to see him mount his horse. He remained a moment behind, and I saw him slip something into my work basket. I made a pretense of not noticing anything on account of his extreme embarrassment. After his departure, I found in my basket a sealed letter addressed to me. It contained only these words. Offered to my dear cousin by her friend Ned, and a note for one hundred pounds sterling. My husband returned a moment afterwards, and I said to him, See, here is the reward for what you have done for Monsieur de Chambord. The next day, as you may well suppose, he went to London to thank Edward, but found that he had already left for Cossey. Several days later, I also went to London with two English ladies whom I knew, and whom I frequently saw at Richmond. They were two sisters, of whom the elder, Miss Lydia White, has been celebrated as a famous blue stocking. She had conceived for me a kind of romantic passion on account of my adventures in America. One of these ladies sang well, and we enjoyed our music together. Their books were at my disposal. When I went to visit them in the morning, they kept me with them the whole day, and when the evening arrived, I was only able to tear myself away by promising to return before the end of the week. Having formed the plan of passing a week at London, they implored Monsieur de la Tour du Pain to permit me to accompany them. This little trip to London with Miss Lydia White and her sister put me somewhat in touch with society. We went to the opera, and they also took me to a large assembly at the house of a lady whom I hardly saw. There were people on the stairway, and no one was able to sit down. We had great difficulty in leaving the house. The crowd of guests were so numerous. At the end of the week, which appeared to me long and tiresome, I returned with pleasure to Richmond. Monsieur de Poix, who was living at Richmond, had an excellent horse and a tilbury. Frequently I went on foot to Teddington, a village about two miles from Richmond, and he brought me back to Richmond in his carriage. In this way passed the summer of 1798. We made an excursion of a week of which I retain the pleasantest recollections. My children were so safe with my excellent maid that this little absence did not cause me any disquietude. We set out, Monsieur de Poir and I in his Tilbury, my husband on horseback, and having passed Windsor, we went to spend the night at Maidenhead. From there we went to Oxford, to Blenheim, to Stowe, and returned by Aylesbury and Uxbridge. The beautiful country estates which we visited charmed me, it is in the country only that the English are really grands seigneurs. We were favoured by very fine weather during the whole week which we employed for this excursion. In this connection, I must say that the climate of England outside of London is very much calumniated. I have not found it worse than that of Holland, and incomparably better and less uncertain than that of Belgium. A little trip left me with the most agreeable impression. Returned to Richmond, I resumed my household occupations. The news from France appeared somewhat better. My husband even formed the plan of sending me over for several days, armed with an English passport, which would not have been entirely false, since I should have signed it by my maiden name, Lucy Dillon. At this moment, unfavourable news was received, and this determined me to renounce my trip to France. The news came the very day that I was to set out. Personally, I was much pleased not to undertake this trip, which was very disagreeable to me, not because I was afraid, but because the thought of leaving my husband and children caused me a real chagrin. At this time, I made the resolution never to return to France without them. My life at Richmond was very monotonous. I no longer saw anything of Madame Dillon since we had succeeded in getting some money from her, 
at the end of a very lively correspondence between my husband and her man of affairs. When I went to London, which happened only once or twice, I saw no one except Lady Jerningham or Lord Kenmare, who for a year past had given me six louis a month. Once I paid a visit to Madame de Dura at Teddington, where I went sometimes alone on foot, and sometimes with Monsieur de Poix in his carriage. Towards the end of the winter, Miss White left Richmond. This was a real grief to me, not because we had formed a durable friendship, but because she had been so kind to me that I found her sojourn in our neighbourhood very agreeable. For some time past, my health had not been good. I felt very languid, without knowing exactly what was the matter with me. I was not able to have a carriage, and our house was situated in a remote quarter called The Green. I had therefore given up going out after supper, and devoted my evenings to reading the books which Miss White, who had a fine library, had sent me in large numbers. A subscription to the circulating library is very dear in England, and I was not able to take one. Therefore, you can imagine my joy when one day I received a box addressed in my name, of which the messenger gave me the key. I opened it and found ten volumes from Ookham's Circulating Library at London, with a catalogue of twenty thousand volumes of all kinds, English and French, which were contained in this library. Joined to this consignment was a receipt in my name for a year's subscription, with a notice that by putting the box on the stage at seven o'clock in the morning, I would receive the same evening the new books which I had ordered. Nothing could have been more agreeable to me than this attention. I attributed it to Miss White. Having written to thank her, she made no reply, from which I inferred that she did not wish to admit that she had sent the books. The summer of 1799, my health was somewhat better. Our house on the green had a party wall with that of a rich alderman of London. A little fence, eight or ten feet from our windows, formed a barrier between the two properties, as is usual in England. The house of the alderman had a pretty yard covered with turf, surrounded, like our own, by a fence. My son had arranged a small flower bed in the little space which he called his garden. He entered this by the window of our sitting room, where I always sat with my work. His sister Charlotte often accompanied him to the garden. As we were living in an out of the way place, hardly anyone ever passed our house. End of part two, chapter eight.